Welcome to the Wine Zone. I'm Conrad Edgepick and this is Pro and Con. My guest today is Senor Miguel Torres. Mr. Torres heads a multinational wine company with wineries all over Spain, in California, and also Chile. He's also a founding member of an exclusive club of family-owned wineries called Primum Familia Vini. Great. Thank you for coming to the show. Welcome Happy to the Wine Zone. Thank you. Now, as a ninth generation grape grower, I know you've been making wine for four or five, right. but nine generations of grape growing, um, did you learn to drive a tractor first or a car? I think I think a car. Yeah, actually, car? I, I never drove a, 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 a tractor. No, I don't remember doing that. So, what what was it like as a as a child growing up in a in a large company of wineries? Well, um, you know, what I remember when I was a child was my father taking me to the to the winery in uh, Harvest Time, you know, and uh, the smell of the wine is amazing. I mean, this you know fruit that uh, you could uh, you could uh, smell there it was fantastic. But in these days, when I was a child, we had no vineyards. My father lost the, the family vineyard during the Spanish Civil War. Mm -hmm. They were lost. We, we didn't buy vineyards until the 60s, you know, later on. Right. So, but I remember that. I remember the smelling the... So that's, the that's fascinating. So you lost all your vineyards. That's yeah. terrible. The Spanish Civil War, you know, was three years and Spain was destroyed, as, as you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, we, we lost our vineyard. Yeah. But you still had the winery, so you had a base to work from. The winery was confiscated by the by the government, the Catalan government, but then you know it was given back to us at the end of the war. Yeah. Was it in good shape, or was it was it you know in a shambles? Was it was it still in good shape? Did they break things? Yes, yes, yes. And actually, you know, the, the family, the, the the winery was run by the workers. It was like uh, you know in the former Yugoslavia of Tito. You mm -hmm. know? Uh, so. These guys, they, they, they managed the winery quite well, but my father had to go there every week or so to advise them, you know? Right. How to explore the wines, how to blend, everything, you know? Right, but they still cared for the winery, so they, they took good care of it. That's yes. amazing. Now, um, the idea of, uh, for, for nine generations, you grew indigenous varieties. Right. Right, and then all of a sudden you started planting international varieties, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, such as Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay, right. Pinot Noir. Right, right. Um, what was what was the, the the thinking behind that, and how did that happen? Well, when I came back after my studies in Dijon in, in Burgundy, you studied as a winemaker. Winemaker, enology and viticulture in Dijon, you know, the right. capital of Burgundy. Yes. And um, when I came back um, in Catalonia, we were left with few grapes, you know, the three classic white grapes for the Cava, you know, Chavelo, Parellada, Machiavelo. We had maybe three or four reds, a little Tempranillo, a little Garnacha, here and there. But uh, imagine in Catalonia we had more than a hundred different vines uh, before Philoxena in the 19th century. And they were all lost almost, you know. Everything. So we could manage to make a, a good white wine with the Parellada grape, you know, the Vignasol, just by fermenting it properly, you know, with control temperature, stainless steel tanks, which was very new in Spain in these days. But for the reds, you know, uh, we realized that um, it was difficult. Um, also the fact that, you know, the farmers, they were used to produce the grapes for the cava, which means, you know, good acidity, more quantity. Right. So right. they were making, you know, too many, too, too much production with the reds also. So they were not, you know, that, that good. That's why, you know, we, when Jean Leon arrived to Panadés in the early 60s, and he planted Cabernet Sauvignon in his estate near, near us in Villafranca. And we tasted the wine afterwards, and we thought, well, maybe that's a possibility. And that's when, why we planted Cabernet Sauvignon first, and then other grapes. Was he a bit of a mentor for you, Jean Leon? Well, Jean Leon, he was, um, he was a, a good friend of my father. He eventually became a good friend of mine. And he was a pioneer in, in the sense that you know, he was the first to bring these grapes to the So it was based on what he was doing that you planted uh, Cabernet Sauvignon or did you buy the first his, Cabernet Sauvignon? His experience Sauvignon? plus our own experience, I had a little collection I planted upon arrival from the university. I planted maybe 20 different vines, you know, a row of each, a typical thing for micro vinifications. Yes. And we noticed, you know, after four years that uh, Cabernet Sauvignon was the best red by far right? Right. compared to the other. So all together, and then plus a visit to California, tasting Cabernet Sauvignon in mm -hmm. California. Okay, let's go. Let's let's plan Cabernet Sauvignon. 
Sure, sure. Now, the wine we have here today is Mas La Plana, which is your flagship wine. Right. And today, yeah. it's, it's 100% Cabernet Sauvignon, but this is the wine that put you on the global wine map. When, when in a tasting that predated the Judgment of Paris, right, right. you beat Chateau Latour with this wine. That's right, that's right. That's true. That was 1979. Uh, it was a tasting organized by Go Milo magazine. And um, the fact is that, um, well, the important thing is that all the judges, you know, the tasters were French. I mean, they were not the Spanish there. No, right. right. Why is it good to say, well, maybe the Spanish managed to... <laughs> no, they were all French. And they were, they were very surprised, like I was surprised. I didn't realize, you know, how... Because imagine the vines uh, in the 1970 vintage when the, the wine was produced, they were four years old, very young vines. So and unbelievable, was, unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Now over the years, you've changed the name, right? You've changed the varieties because mm -hmm. you had some other ones in, including Cabernet Franc and right. and uh, Lebre, Ule de Lebre, Lebre first, and you've even changed the oak uh, aging treatment. Yeah. <laughs> so how is this wine? <clears throat> compared with those early ones? Well, the early Mas La Plana, as you said very co correctly, uh, had other grapes, had uh, other, other Catalan grapes, simply because we didn't have enough Cabernet Sauvignon, you know? So it was basically 60% Cabernet, Cabernet Sauvignon, 40% other grapes, right? uh, In these days, Mas La Plana was a wine, 12% alcohol, you know? Less color than today. Yeah. Uh, and of course, it didn't have this, you know, structure, this concentration of this wine. But it was very successful in Paris and uh, even after, you know, I remember Robert Parker gave us very good, you know, notes and everything. Um, along the years, you know, you try to improve things. Mm -hmm. and, um, little by little, you know, we changed the oak, as you said, uh, we changed the yields, you know, today the yields are much lower than before. And the idea is to make, a, you know, a wine as good as possible, keeping the typicity and, um, and the local terroir, you know, in the, into the wine. Right. Now, Back then, you just told me it was 12%. Today, it's 14%. 14 14 yeah. um, there's always been a little bit of debate over that mm -hmm. amount of alcohol yeah. and how the wines will age over time. Do you feel that this wine will age even better than the 1970, this, the 72, the 78, the 82, etc., that had that lower alcohol? Well, I, I don't think so. I, I think they, they will not age that long. Because remember, in these days also, we used to harvest a bit earlier. Mm -hmm. With higher acidity. With higher acidity, exactly. exactly. You got it right. Higher acidity, you know, so the wines could age. Even, you know, you have to say that the first five years, the wines were not, you know, that prepared to be them. Yeah, not, not, they were, not that drinkable. Uh, you, know, you know, this acidity, you know, these, the tannins, you know, a little green. Mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, and of course, since many years, you know, we, we wait until the grapes are really mature, until the stems, huh? are real brown, you know. Yeah, yeah the and the seeds know, inside. Uh, exactly, and the seeds, yes. So, it is different. But probably it's not going to age that much. So we give to the wine today only 20 years. 20 years, yeah. although it's 20. drinkable immediately. Well, not immediately, but, but after three, four years. Right, I mean, but you're selling in 2008 right now. Exactly. So that's, yeah. you're selling them when they're ready, basically. More or less, yes. That's right, right, right. Well, let's find out if it's ready. <laughs> God, that's lovely. God, that's lovely. It's, mm. The fruit, the cassis, the structure, the balance, it's, it's, right. well, it's almost silky. Um, and, uh, you know, in this wine, what, what we, we try to achieve is that it's got to have many, many layers of flavor. So it's very complex, very rich in the palate. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a friend of mine who is a musician, he likes to say as well, has to say, Mas La Plana is like a symphonic orchestra, you got everything, you know, and I love it. But, uh, yeah, that's the style of wine we, we like to make, you know. Right, right. Well, I hope you can make it for a long time. A, f a few weeks ago, I met your daughter, Mireya. Oh. Lovely, lovely lady. Yes. And yes. she told me to ask you about all the things that you're doing to combat or to cope with climate change. Ah, because right. it's, it's a big, big concern it is big. Yes, for yes. you. Now, yes. you want to talk about that for me? Yeah, sure. Um, climate change is for us the greatest uh, challenge. You know, we have uh, we have ahead, especially for the near for the next generation. So, for the last uh, seven years, we invested something like ten million euros. That's a lot for us because you know our company sells two hundred million euros. Always. So, 
we, we bought renewable energy, you know, we, we invested in research, hybrid cars, you know, whatever we could do in order to reduce our carbon footprint. And we have a target by 2020, we have to reduce carbon, foot, carbon footprint by 30%. Uh, by 30%. 30%. So, and you know, and it's working, uh, every, everybody in the company is, you know, making efforts in try, trying to achieve that. Why is climate change so important for us? Because the vines are very sensitive to heat, mm -hmm. very sensitive. Probably, you know, if temperatures go up this century, two, three degrees, there will be carrots, there will be salads, there will be, you know, beans, eh? probably, if it is water. But uh, the vines are going to be different. Vines are going to be different. So, so far we have gained one degree in the last 40 years mm -hmm. in Catalonia. We managed to cope with it, you know, thanks to viticulture practices, you know, the canopy, uh, irrigation when we can, root stocks, trying to delay maturation, trying right. to get the maturation, you know, uh, as, uh, as uh, to, to slow and, down and the harvest. Exactly, yeah. and, and going to September if possible. Right. right. So this has been done, but for the future, it's very uncertain. So we have to we have to buy land in the last years at a higher altitude. You know, right. Going to the Pyrenees, the last land we bought at twelve hundred meters. Mm -hmm. I remember my daughter Maria telling me that the, this land, what do you buy it for? Because it's, it's too cold. We it's cannot the right now. <laughs> so, well, maybe, maybe today, maybe, but maybe not tomorrow. Exactly. You will remember maybe in twenty or thirty years. Right. Yeah. And and I think you know the the, the life cycle of the of the wine of the, of the vines is so long. It's forty years at least. So you have to think very much ahead of time. Right. Of course. Yeah. So, of course. So what's what's next for you? China, Australia, well, perhaps Canada. <laughs> <laughs> I would really like to make wine in more countries. You know? I think we have to be the specialists of the Spanish wines that we are trying to do. We have to. We are in Chile. We were the first foreign company to invest in Chile, and my sister Marimar has a small winery. In, in I want to ask you about Chile. Do you do you yeah. grow do you grow any Spanish grapes in Chile? Oh, yes, we do. We do. Which ones? Conrad, we do. Uh, well, the first one we were involved. Because in the Central Valley of Chile, yeah. you only see Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot and Sauvignon Blanc and so forth. Exactly. All French, brought in the 19th century. But in the 1990s, I discovered by accident, you know, a beautiful uh, vineyard of Cariñena vines. Okay. You, you, you pronounce Cariñan here. Cariñan, Cariñina, Cariñina. Uh, yeah. Cariñena is more, you know, it's a Spanish grape. You can sure. say Cariñena. It's more, right. More macho. No? Of course, of course. <laughs> and uh, uh, these Cariñena vines were there. Planted in the um, in hills, in some hills, uh, without irrigation. Imagine, of course, but the south to had a lot of clay. There's no water there to irrigate. Exactly. With. In the south part, it was near the town of Linares in the south. So we we we, we had a, a trial with these grapes, and the wine was great. On the contrary, you know, Cariñena is normally in the Central Valley, never considered for the quality wines. It's just a filler grape. Exactly, because it's irrigation, 200 hectoliters to the hectare. And so forth. Yeah. So Cariñena was the first grape we discovered. We then brought other Spanish grapes. We bought Morastre, we bought Tempranillo for you know, experimentation. And the other grape we are using today uh, a lot is the one called Pais. Pais, which is a, which is a local grape. It's a local grape that was brought there by the Spanish in the 16th century. From Spain? From Spain. Right. It's like the mission in California. Do you still have Pais in Spain? Yes, just a little you, bit. You go to the Canary Islands and there is a grape called Vistan. Okay. And that's the same. Okay. See, it's very easy to understand. The Spanish uh, fleet, when uh, leaving Spain, going to America in the 16th, 17th century, the last stop on the way was the Canary Islands, uh -huh. and specifically the island of Gomera, which is very much advanced in the in the Atlantic. Right. So in La Gomera, they took water, they took you know cattle, whatever, and of course fruits including grapes. And fruits including grapes. And these grapes were eaten as fresh grapes for the first two weeks maybe. Afterwards they became resins, you know? Right. They ate the resins. Right, right, okay. And the seeds the seeds were planted upon arrival. So they didn't take cuttings, they just planted seeds. The Amazing. Seeds. That, totally that, amazing. That's, that's how it all started. Fantastic. And you see Pais in, uh, in, in California, in Mexico, in Chile. Yeah, it's very interesting. Right. And which is great today, uh, my son decided to make a sparkling wine, which is just now introducing in, uh, in Canada. And it's, and it's great. It makes a very, you know, uh, a very interesting uh, sparkling uh, rosé. Okay. Wine. And in California, you have one of the coolest regions in Russian right. River Valley. Exactly. Right. Pretty close, just about 20K from the 20 kilometers from the ocean. 
That's maybe right. not even. Yeah, yeah, correct. It's cool. So again, you're looking for cool. You're looking for cool regions everywhere around the world. Yes, you you can say that, and especially because uh, the idea in California was to have Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, so a cooler climate was much better. You have to look into Niagara Peninsula because we have a cool climate here. Really? I'm yeah. serious. I'm serious. Okay. Pinot Noir, Chardonnay. Uh -huh. I don't recommend Cabernet Sauvignon, but in 50 years maybe Cabernet Sauvignon. Maybe what I should do, you know, would be the next time go to the north and buy some land, you know, for the future, no? Well, you, you could, you could. The Yukon Territory is getting pretty warm these days. <laughs> I can have a good advisor uh, here with, uh, with our importer, uh, family yes. wine merchants. Family wine merchants, yes. Well the culture, so maybe they, should, they should take you and tour you around the Henry of Pelham okay. Winery and, uh, I'll talk and, to and you'll, you'll yeah. Yeah, <laughs> buy them out. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming in. I really appreciate your coming in. I'm delighted. It's been, uh, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. And, and thank you for watching. Come back again. We'll have another fascinating guest right here on Pro and Con. Cheerio.